Winston. I'm the founder of the White Art Collective. I'm a musician, filmmaker. I've DJed. I've done wedding DJ stuff. I've done DJed in clubs. So I have kind of a broad experience like with different cultural types of events. I've also done some event organizing um, and that kind of thing. So like music festivals and stuff like that. Small stuff, but still, you know, in that vein. Um, I'm a Midwesterner from the United States. And uh, yeah, I'm a I'm in part of the movement. I would I wouldn't I'd say dissident right. I would call myself a white nationalist, even though that's a very dirty word at the moment. Uh, but I don't care. Screw these people. Um, I I th- believe that. And, and when I say white nationalist, I want all traditionally white countries to maintain their majorities and their super majorities. And I fully support all of them, including South Africa. They don't have a majority, but I think we should work back in that direction with them. But uh, yeah, just my I, I started the White Art Collective because I saw and I actually saw this before I was even really fully red pilled. I saw a need for artists to organize because we're just kind of often kicked around, whether by the business side of things or kind of just by society in general 
we uh, we provide a lot of things of value, music, film, and all these things that people enjoy. And then the business industry kind of kicks us around, and we don't get our fair shake money-wise, and uh, sometimes kind of looked down upon by society as though being an artist is is not a a good uh, a respectable trade, basically. But that's kind of a modern concept. You know, I want to get back to a type of artistry where basically an artist is kind of a tradesman. You know, you're you're taken more seriously because what you do has serious implications in society at large. And in that way, I think I'm in alignment with people uh, like Brendan Hurd, who has written a book and who's in the movement. His book's called The Decline and Fall of Western Art. And he kind of gets at the roots of how the modernist, i.e. the communist, infiltrated our art and kind of started, that's really the place where they first started imposing this idea of non-judgment which is essentially the idea of this you know equality that and there can be no level of discrimination they kind of first entered that into our consciousness via art and they did it with art and art criticism so um, i kind of think we need to reverse engineer that process in a way um, in order to legitimize our artistic movement and essentially, I think we need an artistic renaissance of romanticism and realism to really get back into a healthier mode as a society and as a civilization as well. I think uh, a lot of times when these kind of things, these kind of revolutions happen politically, there has to be a cultural wing to it as well. And that's really what I'm focused on. So I started the White Art Collective you know, just because I was so tired of these attacks on our culture and our art, and I saw the need to bring people together so we can also leverage our very limited resources. You know, I mean, Hollywood has millions and millions of dollars to throw away on ridiculously crappy movies, and the music industry puts out garbage, but it's all really highly produced. So, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, get our people to come together to help each other collaborate and create things better than the sum of the individual parts. And, and I think we've definitely been achieving that uh, on our show, Saturday Night Live Stream. We feature, which is on the White Art Collective YouTube channel, we feature artists. Uh, it's very, we have a lot of musicians. I'm, I'm working with probably like 25 to 30 different musicians and groups. And we also uh, feature like visual artists. I'm trying to do that more often, feature more visual artists on there. And uh, we've got writers in the White Art Collective as well. I want to start featuring some of their stuff. But we did have No White Guilt and The Great Order on there uh, about a, probably a month and a half ago or so. And they featured some of their poetry and some of their writing. So that was cool. So we have done, we have done some of that. And we have also featured visual artists as well. I'd like to get some more comedy because um, I try to keep it a an entertainment show and it's you know it's called Saturday Night Livestream I'm kind of trying to re re co-opt that time slot and that con concept back to our side because the the Saturday night Saturday Night Live you know the the big time one uh, it's it's always been kind of subversive but it's definitely completely subversive at this point and uh, basically we want to take that back but yeah so I'm bringing people together for collaboration and preservation and I think we're we're starting to we're starting to really take root I think we're, we've developed a strong community of people like I said of uh, total I've probably got uh, 30 40 no it was probably more like between 40 and 50 like artists and allies that I'm working with um, creating on different projects uh, doing different things we're also even working on organizing traditional dances and I've, I've put together a team behind the scenes we're working on that and we're putting together a uh, like a little kind of manual on how to organize an event like that like I said I have some event organizing experience but um, I think that's another important cultural element so I'm kind of I'm kind of very broadly you know it's artistically based but just broadly trying to cultivate culture anywhere and everywhere I can Right on, man. So I wanted to talk about the uh, philosophy you had, because I think you and I see eye to eye, and I think it was kind of a separate thing. And I didn't realize, like, again, starting to creep on you, I didn't realize, like, 
how deep it went and how many people you've gathered. It's pretty awesome because like I saw on the site, and I don't think all of the people are are on your site in your like uh, directory, and even like your own music, like uh, some of it. I I it, yeah, just the, the rabbit hole kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. Like uh, big or was it? must uh, beard america beard america and there's all these other like you know different things and, and i didn't know that you're a filmmaker and then you said you were doing contests like it just it's awesome it's good stuff but i wanted to focus specifically on um your philosophy with it because i think you had said um you wanted to keep it positive and one of the things that that you noticed and i've seen it as well is that people i guess in the quote-unquote movement are more I don't want to say like pessimistic, but yeah, like I think you said whiny and kind of just like, you know, victim complex basically. And that doesn't attract anybody. People want to go to where the party's at. People want to go to something positive. And so, you know, listening to a lot of the stuff that you play uh, in your streams and, and the stuff that you kind of, um, I don't know, spotlight on your site. I like that a lot of it is positive and that it's like, you know, loving your people, loving a family, building a family, these kinds of things, which I think is great. But I, I wanted to disagree a little bit. And um I guess I'll sample it right here. The guy is Andrew Claven, and so he's a—I guess he's a secular Jew who went Christian. So it goes into the debate of you know how much of the the Jewish identity is, you know, the nature nurture debate because he's always—he I found he was a lot less uh, intolerable than Ben Shapiro. I used to listen to their podcast, and as as I started to get kind of like woke on the JQ, I was like, God, Ben Shapiro is so annoying. You know, I started to listen to Claven a lot more. Now I don't really listen to those guys at all, but. Um, I still like him. I still respect this guy. And so let me sample that. I'll put that in right now. I've been, uh, I've been making a living writing novels and movies uh, for 25 years. That's been my, really my only living. And I feel that the problem that conservatives have uh, entering this field and supporting this field, which is even more important because we get no support, um, is that they don't understand that conservative art doesn't look like conservative life. Okay, conservatives have been picking on the arts since men wrote on walls. Okay, now, Ovid, the, the, one of the formative poets of my life, was banished to an island the size of this table for writing pornography. Uh, the Vatican painted drapery on the nudes of Michelangelo. Uh, Ulysses and uh, Lady Chatterley's lover had to go through court cases before to keep from being banned as pornography, rock and roll, sex in the movies. Conservatives have opposed them all. As a result of this clever strategy, there are now no, no conservatives in the arts. I mean, the, the arts are so completely dominated by the left uh, that they can now blacklist us. And, and even worse, uh, they can uh, ignore and give, uh, give bad reviews to good pieces and, and uh, good reviews to bad pieces that support their politics, which they do. Every week on Law and Order, they rewrite a political event that favored the right to favor the left. The movies that have been coming out for the last 40 years have been rewriting uh, history and politics uh, to do the same thing. Argo w won the Oscar, I think, last year, and it re it, good movie. It's a good movie. It rewrote the Iran hostage crisis as being America's fault, and it rewrote Jimmy Carter as a competent president and a fine statesman who brought everyone out safely. Shoot me dead, please, okay? Now. I just want to be clear about this. I, I live a very uh, conservative life, all right? I've been a family man for, you know, more than 30 years. Uh, you know, it may be too much information, but my sex life basically consists of my wife and watching Game of Thrones. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I live a life that could be a Hallmark movie. I don't watch Hallmark movies. And I stopped watching Blue Bloods after a while because I knew what they were going to say. I knew they were going to confirm my values. I knew they were going to confirm my ideas. I want to see Tosca. I want to see Macbeth. I want to see The Sopranos. I want to see people commit adultery. I want to see sex. I want to see violence. I want to see murder. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what the art, those are the great stories. Those are the great stories that tell the internal, what the internal life of man is like. That's what the arts are for. They are for communicating what it is like to be a human being. You cannot do that on the Hallmark Channel, okay? <laughs> so conservative art is art that tells the truth because conservatives are, are truth-based people. If, if the truth opposes conservatism, we change our minds, okay? What, what the left has done is they tell, they make good art that tells lies. And that's what we should be fighting. The, the right does not need, we do not need another pundit telling us 
about Miley Cyrus's backside. We, yeah, so help me, we do not need it. What we really do need, and we need it desperately, is we need uh, think tanks, grants, awards, and more importantly than anything else, uh, review venues, venues that talk about the arts, uh, that favor people who support the American ideal of individual liberty. I mean, right now, if, if my wife wants to hear about the new jazz artist or the great hot new television show or watch Brian Cranston get interviewed or hear him get interviewed, she has to turn on NPR and get socialism with her culture. Where, where are we on this? You know, we just are not supporting uh, the artists who believe what we believe and who know what we know. And that's what we have to start doing. Good morning, Mr. Clavin. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Luke Keller from the University of Cincinnati, and my question is, uh, what is the key to making a conservative movie studio that doesn't have to rely on religious or political movies of the future? Uh, that's, that's a real, see, the, the thing is, art is not made by politicians, it's made by artists. Like, I'm an artist who happens to be a conservative, and that's how you get art, right? That's how you get good stories. It's not a guy sitting around going, how can I sell our values, right? But, but, if you don't start to put money behind culture, uh, you know, if you put the money behind the culture, if you build it, they will come. If you build a place for conservative artists, they will come. And there may not be as many of them, but they're just looking for a place to go. Look at what happened when they built PJTV. Suddenly, Steven Crowder and me and Bill Whittle, we all came out of the woodwork. You know, it's like, oh, you want us to be funny about conservatism? You know, knock me out. You know, I mean, that was what uh, Andrew Breitbart was trying to build. One of the last conversations I had with Andrew, he asked me to be the president of a new think tank he was building, in, he wanted to build in Hollywood. You know, and he said, I just want artists to come together and talk to each other. So I, I think the money can come from political people but you've got to let artists be artists. And the thing is, artists are not gonna be straight down the line conservatives. They're gonna be culture critical, which conservatives don't like. You know, part of being an artist is criticizing your culture. But, but they are going to support values that you can get behind. And that does happen. It still does happen in Hollywood. The only problem is when you see like the, uh, the Dark Knight movies, those are deeply conservative movies. You know, I used to joke that if Batman took his mask out and off and they found out he was George W. Bush, they, they, they'd really hunt him down. So I mean, it, it does happen, but I think you need, uh, you need the conservative money to allow artists to be artists. It's very hard to do because the minute you start cursing, the minute you have a character use the name of Jesus in vain, they start to say, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. But that's art. Artists doing, you know, the, the most conservative work of art of my time, I think, is The Sopranos. You know, it is filled with violence, nudity, uh, foul language, and yet it supports conservative values if you watch it closely and carefully, and it's great, it's great. And so that's, that's the problem we have, and that's the problem we have to overcome. We need a billionaire to come along and say, all right, I'm gonna let the animals in there, you know, and, and they let them do what they do, because artists are nuts, you know, and we've gotta do what we do. And the thing he says is that th this is the problem, and it's basically, it's why Christian movies and right-winger movies generally suck and have a bad, have a bad reputation, because they get a little bit, they, they purity spiral on the opposite side. They're kind of like Ned Flanders, like everything's got to be too, too, um, too nice, and it's like everything's got to be this, this perfect kind of, and it's just not realistic. And what he said is that, that reality is nitty and gritty. And that one of the most um, right winger shows he's ever watched is The Sopranos, and it's but it's full of sex and gross stuff, and and I like that. And so I think there's a balance to be had. And um, yeah, personally, I love the positive stuff. I think we need more of that. But I think there's like maybe someone someone I like is like Mr. Bond, and he does hip hop, but it's 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 still kind of a victim. But I think it's it turns into anger, and I think that's kind of the balance. Uh, is is you can you can maybe take a tragedy, and um, like you talked about how they, they glorify heroin uh, abuse or just drug addicts in general, and people start to replicate it, right? So this is horrible, and this is toxic for society and for our people. But I think, I think it's human nature to kind of, you know, to stare at the car crash on the side of the road. And, you know, go, going back to, like, Shakespeare, I think, you know, in Greek, Greek uh, plays and everything, there's always the, the obsession with tragedy. And I think we can, we can take it we can embrace it and, and just kind of make it a lesson of like, hey, don't, don't tempt the fate or something like that, you know, whatever, Romeo and Juliet, don't, 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 um, don't let your hubris get, get to you and understand they were basically young, dumb kids. That was, you know, I don't know if that's the, it's oversimplified moral, but you know, certain things like that, you can take the drug use, like 
an animation I wanted to to do is is to show the the tragedy of feminism and how sad it is to have these little girls be lied to, and and it's you know it's and I I I like smart women so I would date older women, and a lot of them are unhappy and they focus on their careers and they're now they're you know they're popping SSRIs and they're suburban winos it's it's a it's a legit tragedy, and so. I don't know. I, I, I guess the, the last thing I'll say, and I'll shut up on this, is like with the, to bring it back to Mr. Bond and hip hop. I think one of the reasons that hip hop, even black stuff, like I used to listen to Dead Prez, which is all about, you know, like fuck the white man. And I remember, you know, before I was red pilled, I used to listen to this and yeah, yeah, you know, so stupid. I look back and I'm like, Jesus Christ. But I mean, partly it's to live through, you know, the same way that like conservatives, the Zionists want to live um, vicariously through Israel, you know, have the wall and these kinds of th- this, this ethno nationalism that they, they want to have themselves, but they can't. So they live vicariously through it or football or whatever. That's part of the hip hop thing. But I think also there's that, that anger. There's something about that. It doesn't, it is attractive. You know, there, there's a, that machismo. So I think part of the, um, the alt right stuff when it's not just like, Oh, woe is me. And the, you know, the, the, you know, the powers that be, the Jews, whatever, keeping us down when it's like, no, let's fucking tear down the world. This is a clown world. Let's just, you know, like this kind of like this punk rock riot kind of stuff, the metal. I think that attracts a lot of people. Um, but we definitely, yeah, we definitely need more positivity because if it's all negative, whether it's anger, whether it's kind of a catchy and cool, you know, edgy, that's still, that's still not enough. And, and, um, you can't just tear down the society. You need to build something. So, um, yeah, I respect what you're trying to do. And I guess, did you want to just kind of go off and tell me, and the listeners, what what you think and what your 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 grand schemes are, what you want to build? Yeah, and I like to respond to that point well taken. Um, as far as the positive, when I say that, I always say kind of my my saying is like I, I tell people, let's try to create more pro us than anti them. The key I think is that we need to have a a core that is moralizing, because. We we go through so much demoralization, which is what you're talking about there with like people black pilling and and so much of like the the propaganda, the way communists construct propaganda is just intentionally to demoralize. Actually, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Brahman, but he he's created this whole philosophy and uh, it's very interesting. I'm not 100 percent on board with him, but I think it's really fascinating. I really like Mark. And I, I respect what he's doing, and I think he's correct about this. But he he basically has this whole thing talking about how it's called like Jewish esoteric moralization, and he's also working on like Aryan esoteric moralization, and it's this symbology in art, and how ultimately we need to be creating art that is ultimately moralizing and building our people up in the positive. And so that's that's what I mean by that is it's just it's essential that we have that nuclear core of our art that is is uh, moralizing. And it, I know it's a point well taken on the Ned Flanders thing, too. Um, I think that's also kind of the state of Christianity and also just kind of modern consumerism. You know, the church is not what it used to be, but so much of the the most beautiful works of art, in my opinion, ever, you know, like the Sistine Chapel and some of the music, I, I was actually just looking into uh, Bach, who I often use as an avatar, and talking about how pious he was and how, like, basically everything he wrote was for God, for the glory of God, you know. And his stuff, like one of his most well-known is uh, Hesu, Joy of Man's Desiring. You know, that's one that people really latch onto. It's, it's gorgeous, and um, it's, it's so, it's transcendent.
so you know like there was a time when people for the sake of morality and moralization of our people like this these were the most inspired works of art that are still like powerfully affecting people to this very day but then you have like bible man you know with kirk cameron and nobody's <laughs> no nobody's going to be talking about that and they were talking about it ironically and making yeah. fun of it <laughs> The answer is God. Never was much good at trivia. But they're not going to be talking about, they're not going to be studying that in 50 years like it's some brilliant art. It's crap. It's cheap. It's not, it's not transcendent. It's, it's like, it's like Christian rock. I just saw this statement somewhere. I think it was from King of the Hill. Dad, we're in the middle of the show. Well, I hope you enjoyed it because it's the last time you're leaving your room until you graduate. Now let's go. Hey, what's up? You still have another set? I'm taking my son home. I can't believe you, Dad. You're embarrassing me in front of the pastor. Mr. Hill, you just don't get it. This is how we testify. Raise him! Oh, can't you see you're not making Christianity better? You're just making rock and roll worse. You people are all the same. You look at us and think we're freaks. Come on, even Jesus had long hair. Only because I wasn't his dad. Because, <laughs> you know, I've always thought that about... Um, like Christian rock is basically like Christians just aping the style of rock music because it's what people like and kind of shoehorning their message into it. It's not like that music was genuinely in, like inspired by the divine. So, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, my point there. And that, that doesn't mean, I, I just think the overwhelm the majority of what we do, especially because we're up against this demoralization force, we have to constantly keep in mind how much that is the point of what they're doing. So we have to be moralizing our people. We have to be, like, as you said, like constructively building our people up, not only preserving our existing culture, but like creating it anew. You know, I, I feel like that's a big part mm. of our job as artists and as creators, culture creators and uh, of stewards of this um, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm completely with you that we can have those edgy things. We can have that tragedy. And I agree that, you know, so long as we have a good balance of these things, we don't want to just scare the hell out of people or we don't want to just show them the tragedy of feminism and whatever. Um, but we definitely need that. And people do are drawn to that. Yes, uh, they're drawn to that edginess. They're drawn to that anger, you know. Um, I'm uh, like I've been thinking about now that I've established kind of the tone of Saturday Night Live stream, which I try to keep family friendly. We try not to cuss. We don't mention the Jews. You know what I mean? Like we, we keep it positively about us. And now that I've established kind of that core of that tone, I kind of want to start to branch out and create, you know, maybe another show that's it's later or something that allows for edgier content. Um, cause I do think, you know, that's definitely there, like in comedy, you know, it's, it's hard to be funny in comedy with, uh, if you're trying to be like too constrained, cause you kind of want to be able to be very brutally honest. That's usually the funniest comedy. And so to do that, you usually have to, you don't, you don't want to be Ned Flanders ish in, in your comedy. Um, but although I do think the Babylon Bee is actually pretty funny, it's kind of refreshing to have, you know, like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but like, um, it's like the onion, but uh, it's with a Christian kind of tinge or whatever. Yeah, right? like a, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. <clears throat> but I actually find it to be very funny and refreshing because it's wholesome. Mm -hmm. But not every, again, like you can have that and that's really good. And you can also have edgier stuff. So, yeah, I'm not when it's not that I'm opposed to doing those edgier things. I'm just I'm I'm the kind of person that I see where there is. I'm trying to balance things out, you know. And there's so much demoralization and yeah. that I'm trying to balance it the other way. And again, we can have the because I'm a I'm actually like a horror movie filmmaker. So I like scaring people, you know, not like crazy torture porn or stuff like that. But I've just always been fascinated by horror films and like scary stories and whatnot. But, you know, I have ideas for films that are um that would scare the hell out of people about, yeah, the potential of this, like a, a film about what the Bolsheviks really did to, you know, the, the Russian Christians and the Ukrainians, like a horror film mm. about that, you know, like 
that would be terrifying. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's more moralizing in any way, but it's it's something that needs to be known. And I'm sure people would find it very fascinating. And uh, I've got another one a, idea for a film that's, you know, about a, a girl's like red pill journey kind of through this like psychological haunted house thriller it's kind of you're not sure what's real and what isn't kind of surreal and she's like developing symptoms of like the plague you know kind of a little bit of body horror you know Mm -hmm. and i haven't obviously i haven't made these things yet but in balance with like positive moralizing stuff I, i think this kind of thing is totally fine and i think it appeals to people as you said right Man, there's there's a ton of things that, that you had said that I wanted to touch on, um, and a lot of it is is making me think of like in your in your other interviews some some things. But I guess I'll start off by saying this: that one thing that I think, like you're talking about the Christian rock, the King of the Hill reference, um, my buddy told me, and I just I didn't know about it. And this is kind of the the shitty. It's like a catch twenty two that I didn't know that these bands, a lot of them were Christian. And this is back in the I guess like early two thousands. It's like a uh, hardcore. It's like which turned into emo and whatever that kind of like the punk that's kind of blending into metal that that genre. There's a huge um, surge and a lot of them are Christian and it became the norm. It wasn't just this obscure thing. And he showed me like I'll I'll link it in the description like the show notes, but it's because uh, it's too long to to sample. But there's a ton of like really cool and respected. Not like oh that's good for a 16 year old or that's good for a Christian band. Like no like these are legit. <laughs> you know, right? Like there's there there's no like there's no handicap. It was like, holy shit, they're Christian. Cool. And I think that's the, that's the key is that you have to, it's like most of the things that, you know, I I think it's probably like, um, plastic surgery is maybe an analogy that like, when you know someone has plastic surgery, you're like, oh, it's, it's so obvious. And you're like, Jesus, you know, that's what plastic surgery is. And it's like, no, there's a lot of people who get it and you don't notice. And that's why it's kind of subtle. And so, um, a lot of these bands that just like when you know they're Christian, it's because they're over the top and every single song has got to be Jesus, you know, it's just kind of cringy, right? But a lot of these yes. metal bands, they were like, some, you know, sometimes they're just singing about a girlfriend and their day and everyone knows they're Christian and you can kind of feel the, the themes, but it's not over the top. And um, I guess let me sample. There was a Nick Fuentes, uh, he had a good thing. Someone asked him about there's a uh, religious movie, I think it's called Unplanned, which is about abortion. I never saw it. And, uh, yeah, let me just sample it really quick. Saw the movie Unplanned today. Not a fan of the whole Christian movie genre, like God's Not Dead. Uh, but man, there was some powerful stuff in there. I didn't know it came out yet. Yeah, I saw there was some trickery going on on Twitter. They got banned from Twitter. Uh, this movie called Unplanned. It's from the same people that did God's Not Dead. And um, it's an R-rated movie about a woman who works at Planned Parenthood. And then she has to witness an abortion. She becomes pro-life. I don't know how you make a movie out of that. Maybe I have to see it, but I don't know. It just sounds like, I don't know. It sounds like a guest on Fox News. You know, it sounds like, welcome to the Ingram Angle. And yo, so you're a Planned Parenthood worker. And now you've become pro-life. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that sounds like a five-minute bit on Fox News. But I, these kinds of movies to me, they just don't do it for me. The Dinesh D'Souza type movies, the really over-the-top political messages. Conservatives just don't understand You don't make a movie that's just overtly political. That's not what the left does, right? I mean, understand, where does the left-wing programming come from? Does it come from a left-wing movie where it's about a pro-life woman who has an unplanned pregnancy, and then she comes around and realizes that Planned Parenthood's really great, and then, like, Hillary Clinton comes in at the end and says, vote Democrat, and so on? Because that's how Republicans do it. Republicans are like, hmm, how can we make a movie with a political message? I know the whole movie will be like a Fox News clip. Like, that's not how you do it. Uh, A message, or rather a movie with a conservative message is a movie that is normal. It's a normal movie, but just has traditionalist and conservative undertones about family, about male strength, about, you know, gender roles. You know, that's basically how you do it. You build a movie that has conservative themes It's not a movie about conservative politics. Like, for example, you look at The Avengers. What is the, or Star Trek is probably a better example. Is Star Trek a movie about how you should go out and and donate to Planned Parenthood because abortion's like actually fine? Or is Star Trek a movie about a diverse group of people who work together for progressive humanist goals? And there's action and it's your favorite franchise. But you see what I'm saying, there's a political... There's an undertone, there's there's democratic, liberal democratic themes underlying it, but it's a normal movie. It's just got a liberal message. 
That's how we have to be thinking. So I can't watch these movies. The acting is bad. They're like low budget. It's just so they're beating you over the head with a political message. Like I'm already against abortion. Okay. So I don't need to see the movie. Right. And the only people that are watching these movies are people that already believe this stuff. You know, like Dinesh D'Souza puts out, we need to be propagandists too. So he puts out a documentary about how uh, Hitler was a Democrat. Who's going to go watch that except for Republicans? Who are you converting with that crap? Whereas, you know, if you put out a movie like The Avengers, well, you're going to convert some people with your, your uh, liberal programming. So, yeah, I'm not, I get it. I get it. I understand it. I'm not going to counter signal it, but it's just not for me. But uh, just for you, so so that you know what I'm talking about, he he was talking about how it's it's the problem with conservatives, and and he doesn't go into to why this is the case. This is me assuming it's because we're we're more straight and down the line. I, I don't even like to say conservative because that you know within our movement has negative connotations. I guess right wingers we tend to be more logical and straight, and it's just like you know just show me a, show me some statistics, show me a pie chart, and the you know the bell curve and whatever. And oh okay, and that's kind of how we are. And so we just we just that's how we talk to people. And we kind of like bombard them and just go straight. And I think we need to fight fire with fire and, um, you know, do the kind of subversive thing. And so what he talks about is that in these movies, a lot of them are, you know, it's like Dinesh D'Souza, just like, okay, we're just going to do a movie and these are the morals and it's going to be right in your face. And it's a fucking, you know, when good, um, good art isn't like that. A lot of it's subjective and it kind of, it's, it's up to the, the, the viewer, you know, like the dark Knight. I think you would talk a little bit about that. I remember back when it first came out, a lot of conservatives said, oh, you know, this is an analogy for Bush and this and that. And, and there you go. That's how it is. And that's how you affect the culture. And the leftists and the communists that have kind of slowly now it's it, now it's insanely overt because they just have a you know complete monopoly and it's just like super anti-white and just so in your face. But it didn't start that way, you know. From from day one, it was just this gradual step by step kind of a thing. And uh, so yeah, I, I think I think there's a balance to be had. But um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about that I heard you say that I, I really liked that you try to focus on this uh, and to to connect it to the how conservatives or right wingers um, create art. Is you said you like to build things with stone, and I guess the analogy you're given is like things that last. And so instead of the you know the Bible man stuff, you you know do something that people for for generations to come will still appreciate. And um, I think we definitely see eye to eye on that because I don't I try not to do the live streams and stuff. I try to spend time editing this podcast, and it's just this gradual slow thing. But I think that's better, uh, you know. Um, quantity over quality and it's the same thing you do with your site and that the you know all the bands that you're gradually getting together instead of just trying to do like the cheap thing um and one of the things it reminds me of is from an hbo tv series about um john adams and i just i love this quote because i've always been kind of an artsy fartsy kind of guy but i think us right wingers who are also artsy have the perspective and what he says so it's it's john adams and it's actually pretty historically accurate. It's all based on like his letters that he he um, sent his wife and stuff. And there's a historian on set at all times. So, you know, obviously you always take it with a grain of salt, but it's actually pretty accurate um, for a Hollywood thing. So so John Adams is visiting the French people, trying to get them to to help fight the British, right? And so they ask him and they're, you know, this is back when they're like super bourgeois and they're like, oh, you know, how many, how many plays have you seen? And what do you think about this? And just kind of, you know, real uppity, stereotypical French. And he's like, ah, sorry, I don't have any time for that. And they all laugh and go, oh, <laughs> like you, you know, you, you pleb, you, you stupid American. And then he gets kind of pissed and he says, no, and, and I'm not going to do it justice. So I'll sample it here. Uh, Madame Alvesis wishes to inquire if you have had occasion to attend the opera in uh, Les Danseuses. Dance. No, no, no I, I, I regret to say I have no uh, ear for uh, la musique. Oh. No, I'm, I'm afraid my occupation allows me a little time for the finer arts. Il n'y a pas le temps. Il a beaucoup de travail. <laughs> Now, I must, uh, I must study politics and war, you see, so that my sons will have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. And my sons must study uh, navigation, commerce, and agriculture, so that their children will have the right to study uh, painting and poetry and music. It would be interesting to do, you know, you're talking about making things in stone. I would, I would be very fascinated to do a survey and see how many like architects are right wingers. You know, how many people do this, the, the romantic art, you know, the realistic stuff instead of this modern art crap that just gets, uh, you know, astroturfed and, and, 
put on a pedestal when it's just absolute trash, you know? Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I'm glad that you picked up on that. Cause that, that's a very meaningful statement to me. Cause actually where I'm from, uh, they actually really do like pull stone out of the earth, you know? So like, that's a big part of the industry there. And so, yeah, I, you know, I always like to think like where I'm from, we make things out of stone. And I, I just think it's, it's, as you picked up on, you know, it's, I, I've always, I've always thought about art in that way. I'm like, will people study what I do in a couple hundred years? You know, and it's, it's not, not necessarily, I don't mean that to be like an arrogant thing. It's more of just like, am I really making something worthwhile? That's the way I've always just inherently thought about these kinds of things. Cause I'm just, I'm the kind of guy, like, I don't want to do it if, you know, if I'm not really going to do it. And if you're really going to do it, I mean, as crazily ambitious as it sounds, you know, like I really, really want to do it to where, yeah, at least maybe someone will look back, you know, maybe it will have that kind of significance. You can, you can only hope or try for that and who knows how, where it will land, you know, but uh, I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I respect, of course, the people, you know, just like with Bach or, or Michelangelo or Da Vinci and so many other, you know, the, the myriad of incredible artists and craftsmen uh, throughout, you know, from of European descent who did such amazing things. Like if you think about the Sistine Chapel, you know, like it's it's actually to spend that much time and, and also to architecture, like to spend that much time just creating a painting or making a building, you know, like you could make a building so much faster to just have a functionality to it. It's actually kind of illogical to spend that much time to add these these ornaments and this, you know, this incredible level of craftsmanship. And I think that that just runs in our, our veins inherently. It's just like, but you want to make it worthwhile. You want when someone comes into this place, you want them to to take transport them to a higher level than they ever could have gotten on their own, you know, that someone did take that level of care and time to create this thing that people are going to talk about and be affected by in a moralizing way for hundreds and thousands of years, you know, like what an incredible accomplishment, you know? So I always, and again, you know, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't do it out of uh, like ego or anything. Cause I, I mean, I have no idea, but I just, I at least like to think of, and I judge other pieces of art on that as well. I'm like, you know, is, is anybody going to be studying this even in 50 years? Like, you know, like, let's say of the musical styles of our current time, like what, you know, what artist do we think would, would, would someone be studying? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting question because they're probably going to be studying somebody or something. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's, you know, visionary and ahead of its time. And that's, and that's built to last. And, and so much of everything else is just crap that, no one is going to remember. And a lot of people, I think they just, they approach it that way. They're like, Oh, I wrote a song and eh. they kind of like poop it out and there it is, you know, and it's just kind of meaningless. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's very base, you know, B-A-S-E and often B-A-S-S. And it, it just has, it doesn't mean anything. So no one's going to care it, when that fad passes like a Cardi B or, Nicki Minaj, who those those two like are like the same person to me. Uh, <laughs> they, literally, they look, yeah, they look incredibly so. But this like the whole persona and everything. I don't even know how yeah. people like differentiate. You know, it's like it's like the exact same thing. But um, yeah, I mean, no one's gonna care about that. That doesn't mean anything. It's crap, and it's you know, it's it's forgettable. So yeah, I try to. I want to encourage people too, like. To, to make the best possible thing we can. I mean, to me, that's very important. Even if we have very few resources, you know, which right now we don't, it's not like we have, no one's throwing money at us and that kind of thing. But I think we can make up for a lack of resources and money with just putting more care and craftsmanship into what we create. Amen, man. And I think, uh, honestly, some of the stuff that I used to watch, like now I, I just hate, almost all movies and it's so hard to watch anything which is really sad and that's i guess the 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 positive thing about it is that now i'm creating more i guess because it's like shit what can i do and and now i'm discovering people 
like within the white art collective, you know, new new bands and, and digging deeper, which I guess, you know, in, in, in that sense is good. But yeah, generally it's just, I can't handle stuff. But back when I used to uh, be a big film buff, uh, I, I think of the difference when you're talking about, um, I guess, budget, I actually preferred, and I, I don't think it's a hipster thing, but, you know, maybe if I'm being introspective, perhaps, but uh, I preferred 28 days later to 28 weeks later. And I the, 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 peop, the thing I'd always tell people is that I thought it was a budget thing. The 28 Days, it had a low budget. I think it was a British film. And so they, you know, it's not this big Hollywood blockbuster that's trying to get every single country and just kind of throw a bunch of explosions and bullshit. It was like all about character development. And this is back, uh, you know, at the beginning of zombie movies coming back, you know. So it wasn't it, it wasn't a played out theme. It was kind of a, it was a new thing. And so I, 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 I don't know if it was cliche then, but he wakes up in a hospital, right? And so you follow this guy who's just kind of, it was like Breaking Bad, basically, where it's like this kind of like normal, um, I don't want to say bug man, but yeah, just kind of like this like average guy, like the modern man. So kind of docile and almost neutered, right? And he's just like, what the fuck's going on? And he slowly transforms into a guy and, you know, no spoilers, where he's like, you know, gouging people's eyes out and doing, you know, and it's partly for the for a love interest. And so you just get so enthralled. And I, I, I completely agree. Um with the torture porn thing, I, I, I hate the torture porn and I love that kind of stuff where it's a, the character development. And I think it's partly cause I grew up on the internet. And so I watched Goatsy and BME pain Olympics and the most horrific, you know, shit you could ever see, like real people getting killed. So I'm kind of desensitized, which is, which is kind of messed up, but, uh, you know, whatever that, I think that's just the part of progress or what, you know, in quotes progress, uh, for better or for worse. And so, yeah, I think it's a, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think a lot of people, and I think there is a big market for it that a lot of people, never mind if they're, they're, you know, alt-right, dissident, right, whatever. I think there's a big thirst, just the apolitical people I know are just so sick of the blockbusters. Right. And so 28 weeks later, that's when it was like, oh, this is popular. They got a bunch of money and it was just, you know, paint by numbers kind of thing. Like, okay, let's just have a bunch of, uh, what is that? The shot where it's like a, you know, bird's eye view, I think panoramic where they zoom out and there's, you know, drones flying around and just, it was just, there was no character development and there's just no heart in it. And because, you know, for kids who grew up watching Mortal Kombat and, you know, and real people getting their heads cut off and shit, it, it means nothing. You need to take the time. And so I think, um, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to have a bunch of kind of, uh, underground artists who do, do these kinds of, it doesn't have to be trauma, trauma films, but you know, something like that, where it's a little bit more creative. And those limitations force you to think outside the box and spend more time making like a, a real heartfelt movie. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, that That's the kind of like, it's not that expensive. Like I have a decent little film rig right now that I acquired for, you know, like three to five thousand dollars, you know, and it's amazing what you can do now. Like you don't have to have all this film and this giant camera that cost a hundred thousand dollars, you know. There's no reason that it's it's really just the dedication and getting a group of people together who really want to make it happen. And I, I totally agree with you. I, I love short or I love um, <clears throat> I love low budget films. I, like I said, I'm a horror guy. So I love like uh, Evil Dead and uh, Peter Jackson's first films when he was still back in New Zealand, like Bad Taste. And uh, what's the other one? Oh, uh, Dead Alive. You know, you can mm. tell that the craftsmanship is what makes those films like you can tell he really knows how to construct a narrative. And he, he's 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 brilliant. He really is. And I think the Lord of the Rings films are brilliant. And uh, Sam Raimi's great, too. I, I His later stuff with like the Spider-Man's. I mean, I never even really bothered because I just didn't care at that point. But I agree with you that, um, you know, I've always liked the phrase necessity is the mother of all invention. And I, I really do think that, in a way, it, it is an advantage creatively when you have fewer resources. And I, I try to impress this upon people, like, because they get blackpilled because they're like, oh, we can't, you know, we can't make a, a Hollywood level film, so we shouldn't even try, you know. And it's like, look, we could make, if we just had the people willing to, to chip in and to show up and to... Uh, you know, to make it happen. And, and also a big part of that is kind of like reverse engineering around what you know you have, what locations you have, where can you shoot for little or no money? Uh, who can you get, you know, who's talented, but who's, you know, not going to charge you a money or, you know what I mean? Who's, who's willing to kind of invest in it mm. as you are and who's, who's willing to just like help you do any, anything and every, any little thing they can to like, 
increase their production value and, and really put their heart into it, you know? And um, yeah, there's no reason as a movement, we can't be doing that. And I totally agree as well that there's a huge market for it too. Like I honestly think, and of course it's not just about money and we're going to have to figure out a way to like um, circumvent the enemy's uh, distribution mechanisms. And I've got some thoughts on that. I'm, I'm working on some ideas, but but I mean, I, there is definitely a huge market for that. Basically, anybody who's mildly leaning to the right, and I would say even a lot of kind of like classical liberals, I think they're really tired of Hollywood's just totally ridiculous, over-the-top agenda. It's boring. Like they've, even though they're making like record amounts of money on these films, because they're because they're now just pandering to a global audience. That's another thing that right. They, that's that's what's missing is like they don't care. They're not going to make like a, a film for they're never going to make a film at this point that like, you know, like a, a a rural, like middle American white person could relate to. Like they're not going to maybe every now and again, they might accidentally put one out. But most of the time, they almost always put some kind of subversion in there. You know, uh, they, they're going to make them like have a, a black uh, girlfriend or something like that to, to make right. it to where they will never allow us to just have our own thing. So yeah, this, this thing drives me nuts. My, my girlfriend always, she'll tell me, she's like, Oh, I'm watching this TV. She loves all those stupid, uh, Marvel shows and all these kinds of TV shows. And, and, uh, some of them, you know, even non superhero related, it'll be some like cop show or something. And she's like, no, really? Like, there's just like normal white people. And it's like, a, there's no pause or anything crazy going on. And I'm like, just wait, wait two seasons. I'm not, I've had my heart broken way too many times that I'm like, I don't even try. And then every, like, sure enough, every single freaking time that it, you know, I, I wait a couple months and she goes, yeah, you're right. There was a, they, they threw these two black guys kissing and, and just, you know, and they just shoehorn it in. Like it has nothing to do with the plot. You look at all the comments, people are pissed off, you know, and so I just like, I just, I'm done. I don't even try to get into it because I'm a, I'm a pretty emotional guy and I get invested into the characters. I love this stuff. And I think people who love art can agree. And I think we all, you know, you get into it and you, the worst part is movies because you, it's always the climax of the film. They, they somehow throw it in there, you know, it, it, in all the trailers, they make it seem like it's okay. And you kind of get in there and then it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, screw white people. They're the enemy. And uh, every the characters that you've been falling in love with, yeah, they're actually a piece of shit, and you you should hate yourself. You know, some subversive thing. They just like, or I mean, yeah, I don't. I almost would rather it be like in your face in the beginning than at the climax. I think that's that tends to be the the, the one that hurts more because you're like, damn it, you know, like you just. So that's why I just watch '80s movies. You're talking about Peter Jackson. That's 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 where it's at. So 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 you have some some thoughts on the distribution and everything. I think that the 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 positive. Of, of us, I guess the, the, the strengths that we have is like you said, there's a huge market for it. People are sick of it. There's no one, you know, I, they're just so crazy that just even anything slightly right leaning would make, you know, there's a, there's a huge audience, uh, you know, thirsty and desperate to, to have some sort of content to, to swallow like this. Uh, and the good thing about us on the, you know, far right, I guess, is that we can be a little bit more edgy. You know, we don't have to follow this kind of Ned Flanders thing. We can kind of, we can criticize America and American foreign policy, and we don't have to sit strictly on the the right wing, you know, uh, libertarian, kosher kind of thing. And uh, so this is awesome. But I think that the hardest part is doxing, right? That's, and, and people are going to be 10 times more critical of your art if they know, oh, this guy's right winger let alone, you know, like white nationalists or race realists, like you're, you know, you're, 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 I don't know, you're, 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 you should be, you know, ostracized. You're like, you're, you're worse than trash. Like if you, if people find out that you're race realist, so how do you do that? Like I, cause, cause I'd heard you say that you had won a contest, like you're, you're clearly talented, you make art, but you separate it from the white art collective. And I totally understand that. And I think you, you rightfully should, but so, so how do you, how do we, I mean, what's, what's the solution? Like, how do you get this art out there? And like, the only thing I could think of is just support people that are kind of our guys, you know, things that we know, like, like, uh, the Angry Birds is an example I always give people that it's an independent company that was in Finland. I'm, I'm not hundred percent on that, but I, I think that's what it is. I'll put it in the show notes. I'll look it up later. But so they have this, this analogy that I think is pretty kind of clear for, for the people in the movement. It's about immigration and there's the, you know, analogy of, um, America is the bald eagle and, the, you know, they have these like Muslim pig kind of things. It seems to me, it seems pretty obvious, but it's, it's, it's not too in your face. So they can still be global. They make a lot of money. So my thought is to support these kinds of people, Mel Gibson, you know, um, but like, how do you, yeah. How do you let people know? How do you like other than dog whistles? Like, I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, I think like especially in film, obviously, you know, White Art Collective, we have a lot of music and I think it's easiest to produce music, obviously more so than film, just because, you know, you can kind of do it by yourself and you don't necessarily have to show your face and that kind of thing. So that is going to be tricky as it relates to trying to make movies. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's I think it's we're going to just have to come to a point. I mean, the thing is, like, you know, you can kind of make it. Um, I mean, obviously, if it had like any association with like the white art collective, they're going to immediately say you're an evil, naughty person. So uh, I, I, it is a tricky balance. Actually, we wrote out a uh, for my song, Porcelain Doll, Boom Baby. We're wanting to do a video. And basically, we we created the video around the idea that people would be wearing masks the entire time. So we're kind of trying to <clears throat> we're kind of trying to find creative ways in which we can kind of mask identities that's one way to do it but of course you can't do that forever you can't have everything you create have people wearing masks um although it does kind of send a signal in and of itself i think just the fact that you know that would be interesting utilizing that as a way to communicate how uh we've been censored and things you know so i think there's a lot of interesting possibilities of what we could communicate by doing that but also, you know, probably just trying to find people who are already out there or who are willing to put their face out there. Um, I'm hoping maybe we can kind of get our own little film scene going and find some actors and actresses who just see the opportunity that we do and are willing to take that risk because they're just risk taking type artists that see the potential for the, you know, the positive effect it would have and the potential reward if we can really uh, get it off the ground. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping that we can find some people like that. And I, I definitely think they're out there. Um, but, you know, we, and, and also just that we keep pushing and, and making our what we're creating more and more sophisticated. So it's kind of harder and harder for them to parse it out. Like you said earlier, you know, I mean, in a way, we do have to be kind of be like uh, reverse subversive in a way. <laughs> it's mm. like we're we're not doing it to fool our people or to be it's basically to, to kind of like get to open their minds to these new ideas um which are actually old ideas that you know our fathers grandfathers founding fathers all were on board with um so yeah we got to figure out like kind of how to get that in there to where people can uh get back in a, in a healthier and more realistic and self-preserving mindset, you know? So th there is a, there's a trick to that and there's an art to that. And, you know, there's, a, you can be, I think we can have a kind of a spectrum of strategies. Like obviously with the white art collective, we're pretty explicit, but I think we can have layers of people doing different things. And I think we can be strategic about, you know, hey, let's not, we could, ha we could utilize the white art collective to make a film, but we don't have to put the white art collective name on it. I've already done that with some stuff because, you know, the, our main function is to bring people together for collaboration. And I think of it more as kind of like an institution. So, you know, we, we can, we can bring people together to create stuff and then we can kind of let it be more implicit when it goes out there for people so that they're not immediately, you know, turned off by it. And, and I think the most important thing about all of it is that it comes from our perspective. I think we kind of touched on this earlier. Um, I, that That is moralizing in and of itself when people can really like see a character in a show or a film and actually relate to them, you know, like, oh, I see myself in that character, you know, like if you had some blue collar guy who's struggling and a lot of people around him are, you know, doing opioids and the, the town factory closed down because it was outsourced to India or something, you know, like you don't see that story told, but that's happening all across the country. And, you know, people would be so moralized just to see someone expressing their point of view and, so I think that's the kind of stuff that is important. But back to the doxing thing, it's, you know, that is a challenge that we're, it's it's just going to be a big part of the challenge for us. So I think it's just, we got to keep pushing and trying to normalize this and get over that hump to where like doxing just doesn't have the effect anymore. 
And there's so many people who've been doxxed at this point. I think we're getting there. But, mm. you know, they, they they still are able to put enough pressure and make people unemployable. You know, like we really need to get focused on making doxing just not as effective as a tool, you know? Yeah, man. Um, I think it's a little bit inevitable just the way things are headed. People are just getting so sick of it. Again, even non like race realist, whatever distant, right? People are just so sick of the PC thing that it's just seems like it's, it's getting to, to its limits, you know? And I had heard someone, I think it's maybe Sam Dixon during a American Renaissance. To show you the insanity of a country based upon the, the idea of the, a, a nation explained in terms of the pursuit of a philosophical idea of freedom. I am told, I don't know, because I, I know very little about railroads. I am told that for the money we have spent in Afghanistan and Iraq, we could have built a nationwide rail system comparable to that that the Red Chinese are building all over their na nation, where we could dispense with most of our air travel, uh, and we could dispense with much of the paradigm of transportation in which there are 250 million individually owned cars in America, we would have a super speed train system which I would be able to get into a train in Atlanta uh, and step off in Washington in three and a half hours at a fraction of the cost. But no, we spent that money freeing the Muslims of uh, the Muslim women uh, of Afghanistan and Iraq. That's what insane people do. That's what people do when they are chained to lies, when they're enslaved by lies. But our, our, our narrative is based upon human biology, it's based upon human experience, uh, and our narrative will prevail. This American system and its nonsense and the crazy manics that, that, that believe in it, uh, they're on the Titanic and they're going full speed ahead through the night, and they're on a direct collision course with reality, with truth. People who do not wish to see the truth uh, do not change the truth. They can change their own pattern of irrational and self-destructive behavior. They can change their behavior to be self-destructive. But the iceberg is still there. And the reality of what happens when a ship runs into an iceberg at full speed is still there. And that is one reason why I am confident that they will fail, and we will prevail. Yeah, uh, this this shift is happening where it's this this religiously egalitarian society that we live in, where there's just like you cannot even merely question the possibility that maybe nature plays a part. You know, the nature nurture debate. No, no, you know, we're just in this like this closed minded thing, and that's why it just gets to this insanity of. They just keep inventing genders and new ways to, to justify why things aren't equal, no matter how much money they throw at the problem, no matter how many, you know, PC things that keep changing, changing, changing. So I think, yeah, I, I think the average person, you know, I feel it. Maybe it's maybe I'm, I'm projecting my, my thoughts because I'm in an echo chamber of, you know, Disney, right? I don't know, but it it feels like it. And I think even normies that I talk to who are apolitical, they're like, no, this is insane. And they kind of feel this 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 culture, this this shift in the culture. And uh, and if nothing else, just like it, I, I heard someone say that basically we're in like um, uh, the because of the Internet, we're living through the times of like the Gutenberg press. Like it totally revolutionized everything because instead of just the the, you know, the elite having access to knowledge and being literate, it was like even the plebs and the peasants could do it. And so there's this huge kind of revolution. Well, it seems like that's happening where it's basically decentralizing knowledge and that's i think why a lot of people are becoming woke on the jq and all the and like who are who's who's controlling the media who's controlling the news and and uh it, to me i think the dominoes are already there and no they're like that's why i don't really care about the whole gatekeeper thing people say oh you know like jordan peterson and all these people they're gatekeepers i think they can fucking try but it's, it's futile i think just there's it, every day more and more people get woken up and more and more people join the the you know, again I, I feel kind of goofy calling it the movement but yeah the movement you know um, so yeah, I'm pretty optimistic that, uh, things are headed in that direction. And so I like what you're doing. Like I, I've heard you talk about with the white art collective, you know, you, it's still in its infancy. Um, but it's, it's, it's growing and growing and growing. And so, yeah, by the time, maybe by the time, you know, you do a couple projects where people kind of, you know, like masks do certain things that are creative. And like you said, necessity is the, wait, what is it? Necessity is the mother of all invention. There you go. There you go. So, so this, you know, these these kinds of limitations may come to our benefit, and then by the time you know there's this movement starts to come, then people can be more out in the open. And the last thing I'll say on that is, uh, I heard on a Strike and Mike podcast, there's a there's a legal 
group. So these are lawyers that want to, uh, I forgot the name of it. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's basically when you get doxxed, your life is not over. You're still a citizen. You have rights. And they're like, call us, you know, and we need to kind of create, like they're basically doing the same thing that we're trying to do with, with art and artists. And we're trying to like create kind of like a, a union of sorts. They're trying to do the same thing, but with lawyers and saying like, no, we need to stick together and we got each other's backs. And if something happens, call us. So, um, yeah, it's not over. It's not, Thing, things are changing and we can't just live in the shadows, but, um, you know, we're getting there step by step, you know. So, yeah, what, I guess, were there any defining moments that red pilled you? Like what brought you to your belief system that you have now? Is there anything I had heard you say that you you had kind of grown up uh, with your father was a race realist? But was there anything that anything that comes to mind that really like like a cataclysmic moment? Um. I think uh, it was, I'd kind of checked out of politics. Uh, I, I, so yeah, I had always kind of been somewhat of, I was, I've never been apologetic about being white. And that's, I think, thanks to my dad. You know, he was, he was definitely a race realist and he laid it out there, but you know, he would use uh, the harsh language and the slurs. And of course, you know, coming of age, like in the early nineties and watching the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I was like, dad, why are you so mean? And you can't talk that way about minorities, you know? And, you know, I, I fell for it because I was just an impressionable kid. And, mm. uh, and, you know, I, I just didn't understand where he was coming from because he'd had a lot of personal experience that he was basing his frustrations off of. And he wasn't wrong at all. But, you know, so I've always, I was never really like apologetic about it. It's, it was, it wasn't in, but I did go to like a four-year liberal college and that stuff, even though I rejected it and I, you know, it does kind of get in your head because you're still young and impressionable. And um, so like so a lot, I, I recognize like, look at all this propaganda about the gays and about minorities. And I, I complained about this constantly with my friends. Like I was, uh, I, w- I went for TV, radio, film. And so I was in a class called race and ethnicity in the media. And it's exactly what you would think. Um mm. You know, not not quite as bad as it is now, but I mean, that was the point. Was just like it was all critical theory. You know, she the act the teacher actually introduced an idea. She called it white blindness, and she claims to have like coined that term, but it's essentially like white privilege is today. Um, so yeah, I had all of that kind of stuff, and it did kind of mess with my head a little bit. But I was always kind of like instinctively rejecting it. I think I just uh, have a natural you know, self-preservation kind of like, nah, I'm, I'm not okay with this, you know, like I'll be nice to other people, but I'm not at the destruction of my people. And I think when it crossed that Rubicon is whenever the Michael Brown stuff, I didn't really pay attention to the Trayvon thing. I was kind of checked out of politics at that time for whatever reason. But uh, whenever they started rioting about the Michael Brown thing, I was, I'd kind of like checked into the story and I was like, okay, let me get this straight um you know this guy strong arm robbed a store and and then he was walking down the middle of the street which i've lived around uh, some black folks so i know how they like to do that for whatever reason <laughs> and a cop's telling him hey get out of the middle of the street anyway you know he gets in this altercation and it sounds like it's like yeah it sounds like he's an idiot like what's the problem and you know, I, I saw that like uh, black folk were acting as though it was like the 1960s and they were like horribly oppressed. And, you know, I'd been I'd been out in the world since I was a kid watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and, and watching Michael Jordan slam dunk it in the early 90s. I, I'd been out in the world and I'd, I'd uh, worked with a lot of minorities. I knew a lot of them, been around them, lived around them. And I... So I'm like, wait, dude, if anything, these people are like super privileged and we're spending, you know, billions and trillions of dollars we've spent on trying to like, you know, make things equal, quote unquote. And and here they are like freaking out and rioting and like burning stuff down. And I I think that was the first, you, you know, and also some personal anecdotal things, just, you know, things happening on the. Uh, on the streets, uh, someone I cared very deeply about was actually uh, raped by a guy, a black guy, and uh, so that was that was very Jesus, yeah, like that's a very eye-opening experience. 
and um, that that was as you can imagine I was incredibly angry about that and yeah just just things just start piling up um, and then and then of course I started watching like Colin Flaherty and I think I got into like some Camp Christopher Cantwell and then I discovered the Daily Stormer. And I just kind of kept going. And then I became aware of uh, Richard Spencer when he got kicked off Twitter, like right after Hailgate. And and then I became aware Wait, of identity. He was oh, I, I'm, I thought he was still on Twitter. No, he is. But I th- I think he was kicked. I think he was kicked off. I don't uh, know maybe they, it's like alt right dot com or something because he had the site or something like that. Yeah. Well, that's or he might have just been suspended, I guess, or something. But somehow mm-hmm. he came back. But. Uh, he, he is uh, on there now. Yeah, you're correct about that. Um, but that's how I became aware of him and just the, the Hailgate thing in general. And I was like, oh, who's this guy? I've kind of heard of him, you know, through, through these different mm-hmm. avenues. Um, and then I, I got into uh, Identity Europa. And because uh, I was, you know, I was looking for an actual group to join. And yeah, and then I started getting involved in that kind of stuff. And then I realized that there was a need for I was always kind of seeking out artists and things and so when I would go to like some events and that that kind of thing I was trying to find people who wanted to create art because you know I'd been doing it <clears throat> I'd been doing it independently um for a long time and all of these all of these I'd lived in a number of these you know like left leaning kind of art enclaves and they're so far to the left. They they just kind of always instinctively didn't like me. And I, I instinctively didn't like them. And I just couldn't relate. And I also don't really like the art that they create. I can't. I just don't like it. I don't relate to it. And I don't think it's good. I think it's usually kind of lazy and um, self-absorbed. So, yeah, I, I was like, hey, I want to get involved with this. And let's find some people to create some art and do something that actually means something. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember. I, I kind of relate as far as the being out of politics or apolitical. I did it intentionally because I saw family being so upset about politics. I said, "All right, I'm staying. I'm basically. I, I want to be ignorant. Ignorance is bliss for as long as I can because I know once I start to get you know woke, I'll go crazy like them and just be kind of angry and pissed off. And sure enough, it happened inevitably. But before then. I remember being in a, I slept in the boiler room of a crust punk house and I used to hang out and argue with these punk kids. And again, this is before I was libertarian or anything, like basically apolitical, but just, they were just nonsensical. They were just following just, it was just the sheepish, sheepish kind of like, you know, herd mentality of like, oh, you know, fuck the man. Yeah, but why? Like, you know, fuck the man. And it was like, but you're living off of the man who's giving you, you know, it was just, there was, it was just completely incoherent in it. So that, that, as you said, there's kind of the instinctual, dislike i just like i just didn't buy the bullshit you know i was like all right hey let's have fun let's drink let's be artsy fartsy but that doesn't make sense that doesn't, why are you doing that and like, like this you know certain things that just didn't didn't speak so that's crazy though man that's you have a liam neeson kind of story man yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah you didn't go on a rampage that's, yeah that's uh that, that was a very upsetting event as you can imagine and uh someone someone near and dear to me so yeah, and that, that 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 was just one of a number of things. That was before I was fully red pilled, but it, I certainly, obviously, took note. I mean, that affected me um, very. I'd never known someone like who had a crime and who had been violated to that degree. So it really uh, threw me for a loop, and I was I was like seriously, you know, upset about it for like six months. It it really bothered me, but um, yeah, it's. It's not okay, and that happens all the time, and uh, very disproportionately, as I'm sure you're aware. Right. But yeah, it's. Uh, what, what was that? What was one of the last things you said there? I think I was gonna say something to it. Uh, talking about crust punk kids and arguing about bullshit. Yeah, it's just it's good to know it's that you've you've been in that world. I didn't necessarily hang out with the crust punks, but I know what that is, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a whole weird world of these people. They're they're so in, completely illogical and yeah, just a total lack. Uh, I just could not relate to any of these kind of people. And man, I'm so glad to not be in that scene. It's so nice to be around people who, um, who can even think about making art po- in the positive. You know what I mean? And again, mm-hmm. we don't have to be Ned Flanders, but just you know, like 
that stuff is that stuff is so destructive you know that kind of thing so uh, glad to be away from that yeah man and that's that's kind of a good thing again about society being i guess clown world or piss earth or whatever you want to call it things just getting so absurd that they're 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 radicalizing and isolating normal people uh because i actually my buddy i was just talking to him and he had the same, not not same, but similar story. Uh, he, he's an artist guy. He's a, he's a guitarist. And he was hanging around these people, like straight up Antifa people. And he just like, again, he didn't vibe with these people at all. And this is when he was starting to get red pilled. And he just like, uh, and, and he said, so basically he, he got red pilled and then became like Christian and now plays with the Christian, um, like with the church near him. And he was telling me, he's like, dude, these people, it's like, it's a light and day. I, I mean, I, I guess, go figure, right? The, the Christian's going to be light, you know. But they, he said they're basically, you know, they're winning at life. And they're some of the most talented musicians ever. But they're so humble. And all these Antifa people were just like, they were just like lazy. They were late. They wouldn't, you know, and they were just, the, the egos were out of this world. But they're just, you know, again, they're just making incoherent garbage. And uh, yeah, so so it's awesome to see that people people are doing this and i bet this is happening happening all over the world and not just people who are like you know race realists but just right wingers in general 